Y'all ready for the word? Please stand to your feet and grab your Bibles. First Peter chapter 5. Somebody was so excited. They had a cowbell. We said it's time for the word. First Peter chapter 5. Verses 1 through 11. A few scriptures for us today. If you're physically able, if you're not physically able, just rest where you are. But if you've got the ability to stand, we want to ask you to stand. First Peter chapter 5 starting with verse number one. It is written, therefore I exhort the elders amongst you. Whenever we see that term elder in New Testament scripture, it really is synonymous with, with pastors and oversight. I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain. I need you to understand that ministry is not a way to get rich, that you do not join yourself to ministry. You don't become a pastor or a minister or a prophet or an evangelist as a marketing strategy to build your brand. It's the type of thing when you have calling, you do it with or without the resources because it's a call. And so Peter is, 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 is teaching this church that the, the pastors is not about getting money. It's about doing the Lord's work. So we do what we do, not for sordid gain, but for eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge but proving to be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, who's the chief shepherd? Jesus. So Jesus is the head of every church and every pastor at every level is ultimately under the leadership of the chief pastor, the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ himself. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on alert, your adversary... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour, but resist him, firming your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Tell somebody, Effie, we all got pain. We all got stuff going on. And in fact, on top of that, it's not just us. We have brothers and sisters in the faith across the world. And honestly, if we start comparing suffering, then what we're going through is just un poquito, just a light, momentary affliction. But here it is, verse 10. After you have suffered a little while, after you've struggled a little while, after you've been through trials and tribulations for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, Amen. I want to preach today from the topic for just a little while. You may be seated. Father, you are here. Jesus, your blood has covered us and redeemed us and made us sons and daughters. Holy Spirit, you dwell within every single believer, sanctifying us and identifying us as belonging to the Father. We open our ears, we open our heart, we open our life to hear what you are saying to your church. Help us, dear God, to live this thing out in a way that glorifies you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In today's passage, we observe the Apostle Peter exhorting the church, exhorting 
the leadership and exhorting those who follow leadership. And I want us to understand what exhortation is. Sometimes if you spend any time in church, you think that exhortation is excitement and pumping people up and cheerleading and getting them excited. But I need you to know that the term exhortation or to exhort means to earnestly support or encourage a response of action, to inspire, persuade, and encourage someone to do something. So true exhortation is instructive encouragement. True exhortation persuades people to make changes. True exhortation encourages you to do the right thing, to take corrective measures, or in some cases to keep doing what you're doing if you're doing what you're supposed to do. And the purpose of the Servant Leadership Summit this week was to exhort the body of Christ. We had people come as far as Texas and Virginia, people from this local region with the purpose of being edified concerning their work and ministry. I need you to know that in these times, the church needs to know who we are. We need to know why we exist. We need to know why we gather. We need to know why we worship. We need to know why it's important for us to have a lifestyle that lines up with the word of God. And so the purpose this week was really to exhort. It was to encourage. And then with the lessons that we have learned as a ministry, perhaps provide some helpful instruction to help not only the churches that came, but to help us do what we were placed in the earth to do. So the Servant Leadership Summit was really targeting two groups of people. First, we targeted pastors. Our goal was to exhort pastors, to encourage pastors. I need you to know that being a pastor is not easy. I need you to know that being a pastor is to become the role of the suffering servant, to be the person responsible, especially if you are a senior pastor, for setting vision and guiding sometimes hundreds of people. And it's not even about guiding hundreds of people. The moment you have a dozen people that are looking to you for leadership, looking to you for guidance, looking to you for instruction, looking to you to give them some insight as to what it means to live for God, that is a heavy weight. And so part of the vision was to encourage pastors and then also to exhort them to maybe share some things that will be helpful to help them become the best leaders that they could possibly be because we want to raise up a generation of pastors who don't lord over their flock that word lord means to dominate our role as a pastor is not to dominate the people not to lord over them with some type of master slave relationship even the apostle peter in this writing as he was an apostle and he was speaking to other pastors he was saying you know i'm your brother too i might have a role and a function because of my proximity to jesus peter walked with jesus and watched jesus suffer and when you study peter's life you saw his lowest moments and you saw his highest moments but even as he's instructing he's telling these pastors i'm in the same boat as you and so I'm going to encourage you to not lord over your people but to serve them and then on top of that to be an example that that your life has to be an example beyond the pulpit so he's exhorting pastors in this way but then also we see in the scripture he begins to exhort those who follow pastors so we exhorted pastors and we also exhorted staff and volunteers we encourage them to follow leadership we encourage them to serve the mission of the house in which they were planted we encourage them to make themselves according to the scripture subject to their leaders that term subject to means to be submissive as bishop calhoun shared in one of his workshops to be submission submissive to make your sub to the mission, make yourself sub to the mission, to submit yourself to the house, to be submissive, inclined and willing to submit to orders and the wishes of others. That in this ecosystem that God has created, he wants healthy pastors and he wants healthy staff and volunteers. And I want you to understand the glue that holds all of this together. You want to know what the secret sauce is? Here's the thing about the Bible. Whenever there's a secret sauce, it's always not so secret because it's in the scriptures. It becomes a secret sauce to the culture because people ain't reading the word and doing what the word says. You want the secret sauce to a healthy church? 
Humility is the key ingredient to healthy ministry. Humility is the key ingredient to healthy ministry. The scripture says in verse 5, all of you, somebody say everybody. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. So pastors have to walk in a cloak of humility. Don't get it twisted and think that this is some type of fancy fashion statement. No, it's all black. Because the role of the chief servant of the house is to be the first to die. That when you see ministers walking around in what we call civic attire, they're dressed in all black because they're reminded of their funeral. The day that they were ordained, the old them died. And now they had to walk as a servant. That collar around their neck is a yoke. It's a reminder that they are yoked to Jesus and they're yoked to the gospel. This is not a pretentious outfit. It should be an outfit of humility. Somebody say humility. The scripture says, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And so as pastors demonstrate humility towards their congregation, those who follow should demonstrate humility towards their pastors. And as we all walk in humility, we give space for the grace of God to operate. Why? For God is opposed to the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. You think you got ops? You know, that's Gen Z terminology, ops, you know. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Some people think they're so important. Everywhere you go, you think you got ops. Everywhere you go, you got haters. Everywhere you go, you're looking around. Somebody just. The worst op you can ever have is God himself. And the scripture says that God opposes the proud. That means that when we walk in pride, we now become a target of God. And we ain't talking about his blessings and his favor. Because pride comes before the fall. But he gives grace to the humble. Grace is God's divine enabling power to do in you, on you, and through you what you cannot do for yourself. To be a pastor, to be effective, there has to be a grace on your life. Because the math ain't always mathing. The calendar ain't always calendaring. The energy ain't always energizing. Because there are times where it can't be our flesh, it can't be our effort. Tell somebody, it's got to be God. And some of you, because you have aligned yourself with the mission of the house, because you have submitted yourself to leadership, you're going through some things right now, but you also understand that you're on post. You understand that you're on duty. You understand that you have signed up and you're a soldier in the army of the Lord. And you are beginning to realize that when you're connected to God first and then you submit yourself to leadership, that God gives you a grace. Somebody say grace. He can grace you to do what you could not do for yourself. God is opposed to the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So here's what I want you to understand today. Jesus is the ultimate example of humility through what we call servant leadership. Do you know that most Fortune 5 companies, most business leaders tout the principle of servant leadership as a key ingredient for success in the secular world? Did you also know that there was really no notion of servant leadership in the ancient world until this man named Jesus, Yeshua, whom we call the Messiah, arrived on the scene? When you contrast the work of Jesus in view of the typical Roman and Greek gods, all you see from the Roman and Greek gods is hubris. Flash back with me back to high school literature. When you, many of you, had to read the the, the Greek literature, and you read about the Greek gods. It was like one big telenovela. <laughs> Drama and betrayal and lust and, 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 and there were heroes, then there were antiheroes. And it was like, is that person a hero or is he really the villain? And everything was blurred and, 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 and the pantheon kept on growing and growing and growing. And you had all of these temperamental gods. Yet... We claim that there is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that, that God in his sovereignty chose to send his son wrapped in a robe of flesh, humility. Why would you give up the luxury of heaven to come to this ghetto called earth? 
Some of you have progressed enough in life that you could afford a mortgage. You progressed enough in life. You went to school. You worked hard. You did overnights. You did doubles in order to get to a place where you have a home that's safe and where you can make sure that you're building something. Some of you have been some places, although you're grateful from where you've been, you don't want to downgrade in this season. Grateful for where you've been, but you don't want to go backwards. You want to go forward. Jesus was in the luxury of heaven. He had angels working on his behalf. He was, he was, he is co-eternal with God the Father. Yet the scripture says that he wrapped himself in a robe of flesh. He humbled himself to the point of death. He counted it not robbery to be equal with God, according to Philippians. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. And, 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 and he did things that leaders typically didn't do. While other leaders lorded over those who, who served them, Jesus said, nope, if you want to be the greatest, you got to serve. Yeah. Jesus did nasty stuff like washing the feet of disciples, as we learned from Bishop Calhoun. He flipped leadership up under its head, and he made the paradigm clear that if you want to be the greatest, you must be the servant. The concept of humilitas does not show up until Jesus arrives on the scene. He is the ultimate example of humility. What was the ultimate act of service? He surrendered his life on the cross. He became the sacrificial lamb so that our sins can be forgiven. It was through his blood and his death and his burial and resurrection that we can be here now worshiping him. Aren't you glad that you're saved? If you're not glad, I hope you get glad one day. There may not be much to clap about in this life. But especially in the times when you're taking inventory of how much money you have in your bank account. And the math ain't math. And you're looking at some of your friends and loved ones. And some of you are seeing some people that you care for dearly transition and go on to glory. You ought to be grateful and excited that you're saved. Let me tell you why. Because if you're saved, then your eternity is secure. If you're saved, you have a blessed hope of a resurrection beyond all of the drama and the trauma of this thing called life. You can have a blessed hope, a blessed expectation. You ought to be happy that God rescued you from your sins. You ought to be happy. Do you remember who you used to be? What you used to do? You thought you were all that in a bag of chips. You thought that you had it going on. You thought you were fine, thought you were sexy, thought you were smooth, thought you were powerful, thought you were the man. Until one day God put you flat on your back and reminded you that he is the creator of all. That he is sovereign, that he reigns and he rules, that he has all power in his hands. And one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess on the earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? Because Jesus humbled himself. To the point of death, even death on the cross, he chose the most gory, horrific way to die to prove to you that he loved you. But it was after his humility that he was lifted up. Lifted up first on the cross. Before you can be lifted up with your crown, you have to be lifted up on a cross. He demonstrated that through servant leadership. And so throughout scripture, we see Jesus described as humble and meek. And I want us to understand what humble and meek means, because at first glance, you don't think that's cool. There's a lot of adjectives to describe people, and, and, and humility, okay, but, but, but meekness seems like weakness. I need you to understand what these terms mean. Humility is the ability to restrain your own power. It's your ability to hold back. I could tear you apart right now. But I won't. Because of my own standards. I, I could, I could just, just verbally dismantle you right now. But I won't. Because I want to exhibit the fruit of the spirit. Humility is, is, is I know I'm talented. I know I have skills. I know I can do things, but I don't need to prove that to anybody. Because I'm self-sufficient in my understanding that I've got to do what God has told me to do. Not what I want to do. Somebody say humility. And then meekness is the combination of righteousness, inner humility, and patience. Humility describes your attitude towards yourself, attitude towards oneself, what you view about yourself. That's humility. 
Meekness describes one's attitude towards others. So humility is what you think about yourself. Meekness is what you demonstrate towards others because you understand humility. It, it gives the image of a powerful horse in the Greek. But that horse has been bridled and tamed and now is useful for the purposes of his master. I need you to know that being a Christian is not a soft endeavor, that they, you must be strong, but the strength manifests itself differently because it's all bridled and held and led by the Holy Spirit. I heard a man once say that humility is the platform for exaltation. That's a quote from D.L. Calhoun. Humility is the platform for exaltation. So if you want to be exalted, get ready to get low. And some of you are wondering, why hasn't it happened yet? Some of you are wondering, we, we've believed God for great things and they haven't arrived yet. Some of you are waiting for your change to come. And you're wondering why things are getting worse instead of getting better. Remember, humility is the platform for exaltation. That sometimes before you are exalted, there is great humbling. Before there is great victory, there is great humility. 1 Peter 5 and 6 says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Pride causes you to try to exalt yourself in your timing. When you're under the hand of God, he exalts you in the proper time. He's the one that lifts you up, and the ticket to your exaltation is your humility. And he will exalt you at the proper time. There's that word again, proper time, because hidden beneath the English and the Greek is that word kairos. You ought to be tired of me talking about the kairos, but it's all throughout the text. Somebody say kairos. kairos. We're still in the tension of the chronos and the kairos. Chronos. Chronological time, seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. But the Kairos time of God is the appointed time of God. It is the divine time of God. It is the suddenly time of God that cannot be contained with a calendar. It's not about minutes, seconds, and hours. It, 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 is, it is a season when God moves. It's a season when God says it's time. It's a season when God shows up. It is a season. It is a divine moment. Chronos versus Kairos. So here we are at the summer convocation. Do you realize that there are only 163 days left in 2024? I was explaining the purpose of summer convocation a couple of weeks ago and talking about how, you know, summer convocation for us this year is really, is really transitioning from the summer and beginning to look to the fall and closing out the year. And somebody came to me and got mad and said, don't say summer is over yet. <laughs> I, I love summer. I was just getting used to it. Isn't that how Connecticut summers are? Just when you start getting used to it, just when the the weather is perfect, it's hot enough during the day, cool enough in the evening. The, the, the summer becomes elusive, and now we're moving into the fall. I need you to know that there's more time behind us than there is in front of us for 2024. Up to this point, we have witnessed 202 calendar days. That's 202 sunrises and 202 sunsets. That calculated is 4,848 hours behind us. And if you're not careful, you'll start getting nervous because of the chronos. You'll start getting nervous because you started out the year with great expectation, hoping that some things would happen. Some of you received the word that you thought was verified, that you thought was true, that something was going to happen in 2024. There are things that you have been believing God individually, and then there are things we are believing God for collectively, and some folks are getting nervous because there's less year left. They're getting nervous because the calendar is running faster than this 9 a.m. service is today. They're, they're, they're getting a little antsy because they're wondering whether or not God is going to show up. 
Before the ball drops and leads us into 2025, you might be frustrated because some things are supposed to happen. And it ain't happened yet. But I'm here to remind you that 2024 ain't over yet. Just in case you were wondering where we are in this season, yes, there's more time behind us than there is in front of us, but I'm telling you, there's still time for God to do some things in 2024. Don't call it a wash yet. There's still time. There's still, there's still months. We're in the seventh month, about to step into the eighth month. Sometimes God will take seven months to do something just to complete some things. You thought it was going to be the completion of the project. Maybe it's the completion of this season of suffering. Maybe it's the completion of trials and tribulations, and he's just setting you up for the new beginning that's coming in the eighth month. I'm here to remind you that as long as there's time on the clock, really as long as God is on the throne, it doesn't matter how much time is on the clock because at the appointed time, at just the right time, you can be losing the entire game like the United States was yesterday. To Cameroon, but but at the at the Sudan, but at the appointed time, at the appointed time, you're down. But at the appointed time, put the ball in the hands of the king and watch him cook. At the appointed time, God has a way when you give the ball to Him and you let Him do what only He can do. He has a way of doing what only He can do at just the right time. Tell somebody just the right time. So you got to stay humble and keep working. I know we served this week like we've never served before. I'm telling you, get your rest this week. We got to go to Honduras the week after next. We're going to rest up a little bit, but get ready to step into this fall with a sense of purpose, identity, and calling. Get ready to keep pushing back against the gates of hell. Get ready because God's going to refresh you because you can't pour out in the kingdom and God not refill you up again. Get ready because God takes care of those who takes care of his business. Get ready because when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. He takes care of all the things when you take care of his business. You might be tired now. But all it takes is for God to speak and say it's time now to step into that new season. It's time now to see the fruit of your labor. It's time now to rise up and take the territory. It's time at the divine timing of God. You're looking for the Kairos timing of God. You don't get the Kairos with the hands on the clock. You get the Kairos by watching the hands of heaven. In fact, if you get his face in the heavens, then you'll get his hand on earth. High five somebody and tell them 2024 ain't over yet. So here's my exhortation for summer convocation. I've got three things to tell you and then we're done. Number one, be anxious for nothing. Things are still being worked out. Don't worry about it, sweetheart. Don't worry about it. God's got it under control. Be anxious for nothing. If you walked in here with any anxiety, any problem, any issue, Do what the scripture says and be anxious not. In fact, anxiety is intense and excessive and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. Some of us can't serve God because of persistent fear and worry about stuff going on in our everyday life. But I need you to know that God sees you. God hears you. He knows what's going on in your life. Remember, you're not a civilian. You're a soldier. And soldiers don't get entangled with the affairs of everyday life. Soldiers understand that ultimately they've got to accomplish their assignment. But I'm here to remind you that God has got your back. God sees everything that you're going through. Because according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That word cast means you can throw some stuff at God. And he's always able to catch it. If you're willing to put it down, he's able to pick it up. His shoulders are strong enough to hold your burdens, your problems, my issues, your trauma. Give it to Jesus. Cast it on him. Throw it at him aggressively and forcefully he's never dropped the ball he catches every pass that's thrown to him by his children cast your cares upon him because he cares for you 
quit anxious for nothing put it on Jesus put it on your father give it to the Lord he knows what you need when you need it but while you're doing your work number two stay sober minded because while we're advancing forward while we're believing God for great things you need to know that there's an adversary that's trying to take you out you need to know that there's an enemy that's not happy with your progress whenever you set order there's an enemy that tries to come up and disrupt what you set up whenever you get your mind right whenever you say I'm going to get to the house of the Lord I'm going to be on time and I'm going to be accounted for there's always something that pops up to try to distract you from the word that God gave you when you get intense about your service and you say that I'm going to give you everything Lord and you get serious about the pillars you get serious about evangelism you get serious about discipleship you get serious about fellowship you get serious about stewardship I need you to know that the enemy will come and mess in all those areas you know you're supposed to share the gospel but then fear will come over you and little excuses will hinder you from doing what God said you open up your mouth and say what God told you to say you sound that smoke alarm and let people know that Jesus loves you and is willing to save you but you've got to get out the burning house and he's the only way discipleship sometimes when you set your mind on serving the Lord it seems too heavy and you're thinking about turning back but be like the disciples where else can we go there's no other place we can go but forward don't run from your cross walk through it carry it knowing that on the other side of the cross there's a crown when you make up your mind that you're going to connect and you're going to get together with some like-minded believers don't find it strange when the enemy shows up with discord just use the tools that God has given you to reset and to do what you know to do that's what he does when you say you're gonna give your time talent and treasure think you get a bill in the mail that's gonna disrupt what God told you to give just it's just par for the course it's just the way it is you just got to hold on to what God told you and remember that he's got everything taken care of but don't fall asleep stay woke stay woke to sober up means to curb the controlling influence of an order in emotions and desires when people are drunk they get a little they can't control their emotions but the scripture says be sober of spirit be on alert your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can't devour but resist them firm in your faith Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. If you can, everyone's standing. I need you to know that we got to be sober-minded. Keep our head on the swivel because the enemy is coming after your progress. You broke the cycle. You made progress and you took territory. Remember, the enemy is trying to push back your process and your progress. But you're going to stay sober-minded. And last but not least, you're going to trust God's timing. You're going to trust God's timing. Because the scripture says in verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while. After you've suffered for a little while. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I'll end you with this question. How do you calculate a little time? A little while. Like, think about that. If you ask somebody how long it's been happening, they say, oh, for a little while. I mean, is that like five minutes? Five days? Five weeks? Somebody say they come into your house in a little while? That could be five minutes or five hours. I'll be there in a little while. So the definition of a little while is a little bit, a small degree. Here's the revelation that I got. That a little while is a dimension of the kairos. Because it's not defined, but it's when God says enough. Your suffering is just for a little while. Because at the right time, God says enough 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 how much can you bear enough when is it going to change when it's time because God is the one 
hook eyes this season. If you